There's a very interesting book, I don't know if anybody here has read it, called Man on Earth, by an anthropologist who used to be at Cambridge, called John Reader, in which he describes the way that... I'm going to back up a little bit and tell you about the whole book. It's a series of studies of different cultures in the world that have developed within somewhat isolated circumstances, either on islands or in a mountain valley or wherever, so it's possible to treat them to a certain extent as a test tube case. You see, therefore, exactly the degree to which their environment and their immediate circumstances has affected the way in which their culture has arisen. It's a fascinating series of studies. The one I have in mind at the moment is the one that describes the culture and economy of Bali, which is a small, very crowded island that subsists on rice. Now, rice is an incredibly efficient food, and you can grow an awful lot in a relatively small space, but it's hugely labor-intensive and requires a lot of very, very precise cooperation amongst the people there, particularly when you have a large population on a small island needing to bring its harvest in. People now looking at the way in which rice agriculture works in Bali are rather puzzled by it because it is intensely religious. The society of Bali is such that religion permeates every single aspect of it, and everybody in that culture is very, very carefully defined in terms of who they are, what their status is, and what their role in life is. It's all defined by the church. They have very peculiar calendars and a very peculiar set of customs and rituals, which are precisely defined. And oddly enough, they are fantastically good at being very, very productive with their rice harvest. In the 70s, people came in and noticed that the rice harvest was determined by the temple calendar. It seemed to be totally nonsensical, so they said, get rid of all this. We can help you make your rice harvest much, much more productive than even you're very successfully doing at the moment. Use these pesticides, use this calendar, do this, that, and the other. So they started, and for two or three years, the rice production went up enormously. But the whole predator-prey-pest balance went completely out of kilter. Very shortly, the rice harvest plummeted again, and the Balinese said, screw it, we're going back to the temple calendar. And they reinstated what was there before. And it all worked again absolutely perfectly. It's all very well to say that basing the rice harvest on something as irrational and meaningless as a religion is stupid. They should be able to work it out more logically than that. But they might just as well say to us, your culture and society works on the basis of money, and that's a fiction. So why don't you get rid of it and just cooperate with each other? We know it's not going to work. So, there is a sense in which we build metasystems above ourselves to fill in the space that we previously populated with an entity that was supposed to be the intentional designer, the creator, even though there isn't one. And because we, I don't necessarily mean we in this room, but we as a species, design and create one, and then allow ourselves to behave as if there was one, all sorts of things begin to happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. Let me try and illustrate what I mean by something else. This is very speculative. I'm really going out on a limb here because it's something I know nothing about whatsoever. So think of this more as a thought experiment than a real explanation of something. I want to talk about feng shui, which is something I know very little about, but there's been a lot of talk about it recently in terms of figuring out how a building should be designed, built, situated, decorated, and so on. Apparently, we need to think about the building being inhabited by dragons and look at it in terms of how a dragon would move around it. So if a dragon wouldn't be happy in the house, you have to put a red fishbowl here or a window there. This sounds like complete and utter nonsense because anything involving dragons must be nonsense. There aren't any dragons. So any theory based on how dragons behave is nonsense. What are these silly people doing, imagining that dragons can tell you how to build your house? Nevertheless, it occurs to me, if you disregard for a moment the explanation that's actually offered for it, it may be there is something interesting going on that goes like this. We all know, from buildings that we've lived in, worked in, been in, or stayed in, that some are more comfortable, more pleasant, and more agreeable to live in than others. We haven't had a real way of quantifying this, but in this century we've had an awful lot of architects who think they know how to do it. So we've had the horrible idea of the house as a machine for living in. We've had Mies van der Rohe and others putting up glass stumps and strangely shaped things that are supposed to form some theory or other. It's all carefully engineered, but nonetheless, their buildings are not actually very nice to live in. 
An awful lot of theory has been poured into this, but if you sit and work with an architect, and I've been through that stressful time, as I'm sure a lot of people have, then when you are trying to figure out how a room should work, you're trying to integrate all kinds of things about lighting, about angles, about how people move and how people live, and an awful lot of other things you don't know about that get left out. You don't know what importance to attach to one thing or another. You're trying to, very consciously, figure out something when you haven't really got much of a clue. But there's this theory and that theory, this piece of engineering practice and that piece of architectural practice. You don't really know what to make of them. Compare that to somebody who tosses a cricket ball at you. You can sit and watch it and say, it's going at 17 degrees. Start to work it out on paper, do some calculus, etc., and about a week after the balls whizzed past you, you may have figured out where it's going to be and how to catch it. On the other hand, you can simply put your hand out and let the ball drop into it. Because we have all kinds of faculties built into us, just below the conscious level, able to do all kinds of complex integrations of all kinds of complex phenomena, which therefore enables us to say, oh look, there's a ball coming, catch it. What I'm suggesting is that Fang Shui and an awful lot of other things are precisely of that kind of problem. There are all sorts of things we know how to do, but don't necessarily know what to do. We just do them. Go back to the issue of how you figure out how a room or a house should be designed, and instead of going through all the business of trying to work out the angles and trying to digest which genuine architectural principles you may want to take out of what may be a passing architectural fad, just ask yourself, how would a dragon live here? We are used to thinking in terms of organic creatures. An organic creature may consist of an enormous complexity of all sorts of different variables that are beyond our ability to resolve, but we know how organic creatures live. We've never seen a dragon, but we've all got an idea of what a dragon is like. So we can say, well, if a dragon went through here, he'd get stuck just here and a little bit cross over there because he couldn't see that, and he'd wave his tail and knock that vase over. You figure out how the dragon's going to be happy here, and lo and behold, you've suddenly got a place that makes sense for other organic creatures, such as ourselves, to live in. So my argument is that as we become more and more scientifically literate, it's worth remembering that the fictions with which we previously populated our world may have some function that is worth trying to understand and preserve the essential components of, rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because even though we may not accept the reasons given for them being here in the first place, it may well be that there are good practical reasons for them, or something like them, to be there. I suspect that as we move further and further into the field of digital or artificial life, we will find more and more unexpected properties begin to emerge out of what we see happening, and that this is a precise parallel to the entities we create around ourselves to inform and shape our lives and enable us to work and live together. Therefore, I would argue that though there isn't an actual God, there is an artificial God, and we should probably bear that in mind. That is my debating point, and you are now free to start hurling the chairs around.